Coming up on It's Your Call, private pain in public pews. Stay tuned. Welcome to It's Your Call. I'm your host, Rob Melichuk, and I invite you to join us for the next 90 minutes of talk media. Tonight, live in the studio, my special guest is Dr. Elaine Brown Spencer. Dr. Spencer is a scholar of religious, spiritual experiences. She's also a part-time professor at York University in the city of Toronto, as well as an author. Her latest book, which is gonna be our focus of attention tonight, is entitled, Private Pain in Public Pews, Overcoming the Hidden Secrets of Life in the Pews. Now, what is church life? According to my special guest, the definition is the place to handle real issues for people. I'm going to invite you to join in on our conversation tonight. The telephone lines to call live in the studio is 1-855-588-CALL or 2255. But first, Carol Kornacki has a Truth To Go segment in which Carol simply has no problem revealing her past but then in revealing her past, she talks about how one person found her in a certain place, and the key is, looked past her faults to her needs and invited Carol out to church. And the rest, well, it's history. Watch this, stay tuned, and we'll be right back. The doctors had given me up for dead. As a matter of fact, they said I would probably be dead within three years. I was suicidal. Many times I'd taken guns and I'd place them near my head or close to my mouth. Other times I'd take the keys of a vehicle. Didn't matter whose vehicle it was, whose car it was. I'd jump in it, drive it into telephone poles, drive it into walls. One time I drove somebody's vehicle into the lake, Lake Erie as a matter of fact. Wanting to die was constantly at the front of my mind because I had been tormented as a child tormented in witchcraft, and tormented in drug addiction. It was terrible. One day, after realizing that it wouldn't be lo too long before I die from the dis-ease, disease. I always say dis-ease because when you have a disease in your body, it is a dis-ease. But I had been diagnosed with a disease that was terminal. A young woman named Linda Smith, sitting in a church in Buffalo, New York, found me in a bar. I didn't know my name that day. I had done so much cocaine and so much alcohol and so many pills. I had eaten so many pills that I was standing at the back of a bar, a crowded bar with music blaring, absolutely unaware of my name, how I got there, or how I would get home. Linda Smith, who was a Christian woman and worked in this hotel, came up to me and spoke to me. She saw in my eyes demon possession. She saw in my arms the marks of needles. She saw in my heart hate and vengeance and depression. And rather than look down at me because of what I appeared to be, I've said it so many times, I want to say it again. She saw past my faults to my needs. Linda was absolutely convinced if she could get me in the house of God, in a particular place where the gospel was being preached, the good news, because I had heard so much bad news, that my life could be transformed. She invited me to church. That was a big step. I was a street-walking, drug-addicted, demon-possessed, dying woman. And yet this Christian woman saw that either there was an opportunity for her to bring me to the house of God or leave me to die on the streets. After many attempts to get me to go to church, I decided I'd go. Why? Not because I wanted to go to church, but because I saw in this Linda's eyes something that I'd looked for my whole life, love. So I went over to church, met her there, and she took me in. I sat down on the pew and I listened to music being played. They were singing about the blood of Jesus. They were singing about the Spirit of God. They were singing songs uplifting. And there I sat, dying, possessed, with a very, very horrible attitude of hate. Folks, when I tell you I hated, I hated with a vengeance. I didn't know the meaning of love. That day, sitting on that pew, listening and watching and listening, I met a man named Jesus Christ who changed my life forever. This is my point. 
because a woman didn't just occupy a church, a membership, warm a pew, because someone who went to church on Sunday and saw it as a fueling station that sent them out to tell others the good news, because a woman named Linda Smith did more than go to church on Sunday and go have lunch on Sunday afternoon, because someone cared enough, today I am preaching the gospel internationally. When was the last time you invited somebody to church? When was the last time you saw someone dying and going to hell in a handbasket? And rather than just look down at their pitiful state, you made an invitation and said, would you like to go to church? Twenty-some years later, Linda Smith, that precious woman, sits now and looks up and watches me preach in churches all over this nation. She remembers the day I was standing in the bar, drug-addicted, demon-possessed, and dying. I am encouraging you today. Go tell someone. Invite them to church. Ask them to come. Don't make any demands on them. They don't have to lose their tattoos or get rid of their pierced earrings. All they need to do is come with an open heart, and Jesus will fill it. Who knows? One day you might invite a Carol Kornacki and save her life. You know something? Who knows? You may invite somebody like a Carol Kornacki to church. And I understand and I know that when we say the word church, a lot of people like to throw the word hypocrite out. But you know what? The church is made up of people, you and I. There's no perfect person, so there's no perfect church. Tonight's program um, is going to be a very special program. I believe it's going to touch you and reach you where you are. And I'm simply going to throw to you, please, as a challenge, I'm asking you to be honest tonight. Not that you've been dishonest before, but to be really honest. You want to call in and talk to myself and my special guest, and you want to maybe use a different name, doesn't bother me at all. The point is, I, we want to engage in a conversation with you because we want to believe tonight that there's good news that can help you where you are as a person in the pew, in the church, who may be going through a very difficult time. And you know what the story is? You sit there and you smile. You look good. You pretend that everything is okay, yet deep down inside there's real stuff going on. Nobody else knows. And then you know what? You end up doing something that you regret. And we as the church, we're good at judging. But you know what? There's always a story behind that. And not that we condone the sin, but the story behind that is important to understand. And I want to encourage you tonight, please, during this program, hey, I want you to pick up the phone and call in live. The studio lines are open right now, 1-855-588-CALL-2255. Join in the conversation with my special guest and myself. Or, as I mention every night, you want to send an email, it's your call at crossroads.ca or go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash it's your call. Click on that you like us, post a comment or a question. Now, if I could just mention some of you, and I really appreciate the emails that you sent and the comments you make, but you know, I, you probably engaged during the whole show and near the end, you, you send me all this great stuff and I really want to make it part of the show, but I don't have time to do so. And so if you can get it sooner, I'll try to do what I can. I can't promise, but I'll try to do what I can to make what you say part of what we are discussing. And so it's your call at crossroads.ca or facebook.com slash it's your call page and you can post a comment. Tonight, uh, it's about real talk, um, about uncovering the hidden secrets that people have, they hide in the pew. And you know, that statement may be something that uh, even bothers you right now creating some pain, and you may not feel that you can call the show or even post something um, by email or on Facebook, but you know what you can do? We do have prayer partners, men and women, who I know I meet every night are called of God waiting for your call to minister to you. Whether or not you're going through a difficult time and you just need someone to talk to, you have uh, questions of which you don't have any answers to, or something within the Bible uh, of what we're talking about tonight is challenging you and you need someone to agree with you on it or you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but something is drawing you. That's the person of the Holy Spirit. Please pick up the phone and call. It's 1-866-273-4444. Throughout the entire program as well as when we go off the air. Tonight, private pain in public pews. My special guest, Dr. Elaine Brown Spencer is with me live in the studio. She's the author of the book we're going to be talking uh, about tonight. And uh, 
I'm so delighted, Dr. Elaine, to have you with me. Thank Appreciate you. you coming on It's Your Call. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. We're going to have a great evening. We're going to get right into it. But again, here's the challenge. Uh, the lines are open. You want to join in, in the conversation, something that Dr. Elaine and myself may say, what we're beginning to engage in regarding the book. Um, please, I want you to call in because what Dr. Elaine believes is that the, the, um, the place to handle real issues in people's lives should be, is to be, the church. And uh, that's resonating with you. Please, I want you to call in, uh, talk to us, uh, share a bit of your story. You know what? There may be an issue where, you know, you don't want to go to church because of, hey, that's something important that we want to mm -hmm. discuss as well. Or you may as well, but you may say, but you know what? I can't even be real in church. Why can't you be real in church? Um, and be honest with us tonight. So that number is 1-855-588-CALL. Well, Dr. Elaine, you wrote the book, Private Pain in Public Pews, Uncovering the Hidden Secrets of Life in the Pews. Now, before we talk a bit about this, you are a university professor, yes. part-time. Now, what yes. actually do you teach at the University of York, York University? Yeah, I'm at York. I'm primarily in the Faculty of Social Work. I teach a couple of courses, Social Policy, Identity University, also teach in uh, the Faculty of uh, Sociology as well, okay. so sociology courses. So Now, your biography talks about being a scholar in spiritual religious experiences. Yeah. I I've never heard that. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that actually mean or what is that connected to? Well, it's connected to when I completed my PhD. I did a lot of research and work in spirituality. Okay. Uh, what is spirituality? How do we define spirituality? As we know, spirituality means different things to different people. Right. And my upbringing in the church, I really wanted to bring a faith perspective in the uh, academy. Mm -hmm. We often come from these secular positions. And I really looked at spirituality. I looked at the historical black churches in Canada. And I did this whole research around many of the immigrants that came in from the 50s and 60s okay. and the role the churches played in terms of um, immigration settlement, mm -hmm. social welfare, and, and so forth. So I really, really got deep into the sociologic perspectives of, to spirituality okay. and how the church functions, not just a religious dimension, right. but the sociological. So that's why I coined that, yeah, religious spiritual scholar, because this is basically my work that I do. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So um, now, your book. Um, why did you write the book? What's, what, what motivated you to write this particular book? Because I, I've read it, and, I, and I'm saying this, um, Honestly, from my heart, I, I read it through in one sitting and uh, I read lots of books. I mean, yeah. that's, I enjoy doing that. But this book really resonated with me because I passed it for quite a few years and I'm reading pages in your book and my mind is going back to certain people, mm. certain situations. Right. Um, and, and through my own personal life, I've been through enough knocks and bumps and all that kind of stuff where, you know, the stuff that you're saying is right on. Mm. And I guess my biggest... Um, desire would be for people to really acknowledge it. You know what? In church, that's the place that you should be real. And we need to accept that right. within each other and then grow together in Christ. So the stuff that we've got that God needs to get rid of and prune off of, right. he will do that. Mm -hmm. But give us the big picture of why you, why you wrote this book. Well, the big picture is I was really inspired of the Lord to write. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in the church. I've seen, I've seen a lot in you know the tenure of growing up in church. And it was really a culmination of events when I really, really think of it. And like what you're saying, you know, you grow up, you see certain things. And I mean, I write about some of it in my book, memories that I've had of mm -hmm. breakdowns and as a child not understanding what was going mm -hmm. on. And these things really beginning to surface last year, seeing different things. And also connecting back with the pew. If you mm -hmm. notice in, in Christianity, we, there's a lot of emphasis on the leader, the hierarchical structures, but who makes up our churches? Okay. It's people, yeah. right? And um, if you notice that um, in our individualistic world, that's kind of seeping into the church as well. Mm -hmm. And it's creating this disconnection, this fragmentation. And you know, this is just my own observations. Like, you know, I remember when we used to sing out of the songbook, you would share it beside the person the beside yeah, you. Yeah. The hymnal, right? Now we have our projectors, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, mm -hmm. but it's created this different dynamic in church. And last summer, I remember through a series of events, and um, I remember being at a church service, and I remember I was there, 
you know, just in service. And I remember someone was there the night and someone was praying with them. And um, they were going through a lot. And I was there as a witness. And after that, I went home and I couldn't sleep because I realized that, you know, here we are in church, you see, and it just seemed that this individual was really, really going through a lot. And I woke up and the Lord said to write, just write some things that would maybe help them to connect some things okay. in their life or what have you. And I remember very vividly, I was on my way, I was on the gold bus going to, to um, one of my lectures mm -hmm. and I couldn't stop writing. What I thought I was just gonna kind of give them, you know, think about this, you know, cause I have a counseling background, whatever. And I couldn't stop writing. It mm. was coming out of me like, like almost like vomit for lack of a better word. Mm. And I heard audibly write for one, you think you're writing for one, but it's really for the masses. Okay. And I just kept writing mm. from chapter to chapter. And then I remember I would go to this place near Young Street, I would go in this park every day and I would just write and write. So I didn't preconceive to write a book. Mm. I didn't say, oh, let me write a book, Private Pain and Public Pews. It was literally being stopped as the Lord impressed upon me because I believe it's words of hope. Mm. For people to connect to say, you have pain, you're coming to church every Sunday, but God hears you. Mm -hmm. And it's really to connect back to the pews mm -hmm. to say, pain, what are we going to do about this now? Okay. Because Jesus is the healer, yeah. right? And one of the things that you make is unique, and we're going to get to the phones in just a minute. Susan, Peggy, just hang on there. Um, and, and again, I, I mean, I'm throwing out this idea because I think it, it will tie in nicely. And I really want to hear from people, yes. you know, why you feel you can't be real yeah. in church. But, you know, you mentioned in your book, and I, and I, you know, when you mentioned it, I never really thought about it. You talk about how how we spend a lot of time developing and trying to create and train leaders, mm -hmm. which is nothing wrong with it. Right. It's absolutely fine. But the the actual real stuff that we need to be ministered to right. and for, we alleviate that. And so we, we, we train ourselves as leaders, we become leaders, and then when we crash, right. we wonder why. That's right. Because we haven't dealt with some of the basics that you're talking about. Do you think there's... um? Dr. Lane, a fear in the church of, of actually, um, you know, attempting to deal with some of this stuff? Absolutely. I really do think it's the fear. And I think it's a fear around image of perfection, mm -hmm. right? The church is that place where people are supposed to be living for God, living holy and so forth. And if you fall, mm -hmm. what do you fall to? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I write about that. And sometimes that fall, that transition, it's not so easy for the person that's going through it. Mm -hmm. And this is why often we see that if people struggle in certain areas, that fear of acknowledging it because of what will be done to them or right. what would be thought of them. And that whole restoration mm -hmm. of uh, after the quote fall, yeah. right? And I think it's the fear in terms of everyone's perfect mm -hmm. and nobody's perfect. It's just through the grace of God mm -hmm. that we're here and we're standing. But our, but our inability to be real though is creating this kind of the onlooker looking on the church who knows that, well, Johnny and Susie or so forth, you know, they're kind of now discrediting and we're seeing it mm -hmm. on a bigger scale where we see the scandals on TV yeah. and what have you, but there's a life behind these vessels. Mm -hmm. There are events that lead up to the fall. Mm -hmm. And if we catch that earlier, it's just like prevention. If you catch it early, okay. I think that, you know, we would see different things. Because I was gonna ask you, why is that important? Like, why? It's important. Yeah because we need to be real to God. Mm -hmm. God knows us. Mm -hmm. And I think that the life, the double life, is not pleasing unto God. Mm. And I think that if we continue to feed that, really what are we doing, yeah. right? Yeah. And the Bible says he desires truth from the inward parts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's important mm -hmm. because we've got to be true to God mm -hmm. and true to those who see that this is a real gospel that no matter what situation you're in, God can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I um, the number to call in is one eight five 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 eight eight. Call, and we're going to take a call in just just a moment here. But you know, here, here's here's the the question, um, and we're going to dive a little more deeper into the book here. But but why do you feel you can't be real in church? Um, and you know what, Dr. Elena, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful question that I haven't mm -hmm. really thought much mm -hmm. about. Um, I mean, I try to be a real and, and honest person yeah. myself, but I've never really challenged myself and asked myself why I can't be as real as I should be, why I can't be Rob Melnichuk in church as I am at home. Not that I'm different, but 
we're all like that. Right. We all have these little secret private things there. And, uh, and, and the emphasis of the book is simply to, uh, hey, let's, let's be real. Yeah. Let, let, let's talk about it yes. and let our churches in turn minister to people. Yes. And, and you bring out some incredible examples in your book, illustrations where, you know, people in leadership or people just in the pew who, you know, have a moral failure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, immediately it's like, well, they're bad, so we, we discredit them and we move them aside. Versus, you're saying, find out why that actually happened. And, and right. it could be, you know, the, the easy case scenario of is this, there's no real issue, but something did take place. But more often than not, there's stuff behind That's right. that journey. And, and, and if it's preventative. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing what we should be doing, I'm going to say in the church, then possibly that may not have happened. So right. here's the question. Why can't you be real in church? The number is one 888 caller 2255 Okay, 